What's up tech, it's Josh here, and this is my OnePlus 5 review. Every year I look forward to what OnePlus is gonna release because it's been my favorite device pretty much every year for the last few years. I love the OnePlus One, that was probably one of my all-time favorite devices that I've ever had. So this year when they released the OnePlus 5, I was really anxious to see what the experience was gonna be like. Every year it gets better, and so I was really wondering if this was gonna live up to the hype that we always expect from OnePlus, or is it gonna be let down or just somewhere in the middle? I kind of find myself somewhere in the middle for this time around. OnePlus has done a great job in the hardware department. All their designs from every year has been really great, all the way from the OnePlus One to the OnePlus 5. The OnePlus 5 does mimic a couple other phone models, which would be the iPhone 7 Plus, and also their brother company, the Oppo. And while it's not a unique design, it's still a really good design, and it's one that I do appreciate. Actually, I'm really tired of glass backs now. Glass backs mark up easy, they're fingerprint magnets, they also scratch really easy. When you have a metal back, it's just a lot more durable most of the time. Even though the OnePlus 5 has a great design as far as the hardware goes, it's just one of those things that I definitely like to cover up when I have the chance to avoid any kind of scratches. Even if you have a case, you can still get dust stuck between the case and also the phones. Check out this red one. It looks so freaking amazing on the OnePlus 5. It actually kind of reminds me of the iPhone 7 Plus in the red. It's a really cool looking skin and I love it. It adds some extra grip to it. And I'll leave a link down below to where you can save some extra money by using Bain Tech. So definitely check that out when you get a chance. There's also small things that really do matter to me, which are the buttons. The buttons have a nice tactile feel to it. And that just kind of goes into the quality of the overall device. As far as the buttons that they do include, I don't really use that slider for the silencer, although it's useful for some people. It's just not something I use on a regular basis. But it does come in handy if you need to quickly toggle on and off your silent button. I also like the home button and fingerprint sensor to be on the front. And that's because I have a desk job and I also have a desk at home. A lot of the times I have my phone laying on the desk and so the fingerprint reader is easier to access. I actually don't have to pick up my phone to interact with it. And that's something that I do like. It's not a deal breaker to me, but it is something that I do appreciate when they happen on a device. Speaking of the fingerprint reader, that thing is the fastest I've used in a long time. It is so much better than the Galaxy S8, it's not even funny. The Galaxy S8 does lag when you hit the fingerprint reader, but with the OnePlus 5, the fingerprint sensor is so quick. It's definitely the best I've ever used. I ended up getting the 128 gigs, eight gigs of RAM, midnight black model. And the reason why I got it is because of the 128 gigs. I do wish that that had an SD card support rather than the dual SIM card. I think most people would appreciate having an SD card option versus a second SIM card. Some phones actually have the ability to have either or, so I wish they would have done that this time rather than hiking up the price just to get a higher gig model. And speaking of that, there's no color options. You can only get the black one for the 128 gigs or a gray model for the lower model, which was like 64 gigs. 64 gigs with the six gigs of RAM is still a good amount of storage. I just like to have the most that I can get. Let's talk about the camera. The camera is always a big deal to me and I know it's a big deal to many of you out there as well. So does this camera line up with the rest of the competition? I would say it's pretty well with it, but not like even playing field. It does really good in the correct lighting conditions, but once it gets into the low light kind of areas, it does struggle a bit. It's not horrible photos or video, but it's not as good as what I've seen with other cameras like the Galaxy S8, the HTC U11. There was a recent software update that added EIS, electronic image stabilization, to 4K recording, which I was very, very happy to get because at first it was only with 1080p. And I like to shoot in 4K when I have the ability to do so when I do different projects in just different scenarios to where I would rather use 4K. Most of the time I'm gonna use 4K when I can do it. I just bump it up to the best quality as possible. So when you used to have that 4K, it did not have the EIS and it was very shaky. But now, and I'll show you a clip in just a second, the EIS does come into play and it works pretty well. Screw that whole part. I just reviewed the footage from the camera itself and goodness gracious, it's still pretty shaky. So it's better than what it was, but it's definitely not where it needs to be. These cameras don't have OIS, they went to go with the EIS route. With the HTC U11, you got both, which is pretty cool. I tend to like OIS a little bit better, but electronic image stabilization is actually getting pretty good these days, and it's pretty cool that they can fix different kind of bugs or issues with the software update. So that's pretty cool that they're able to add that to the 4K, even though they didn't ship it with 4K 
in the image stabilization. So that's pretty cool. But this is the front facing camera on the OnePlus 5 and I like to try to test the audio, visual, and also the stabilization. I just have my arm extended out. I'm holding it handheld. And from what I can tell from the screen, it looks like it's got pretty good stabilization. It only gets up to 1080p and I also like to try to see how the lighting changes. You know, the sun is pretty much directly above me so it doesn't help out too much. So let me walk over here in the shade and see how the lighting changes. It seems really overexposed right now. So it's a little better in the shade, but still, it's like whited out around me. So that's, that's not too good. Let's see if I can touch the screen. Yeah, if I touch the screen, it changes up. So let's see if that helps out in the long run. Man, the, the auto exposure is not doing so well. But let me know what you think about in the comments if this is good audio, if it's got good visual, the stabilization, all that kind of stuff. I'm always curious also. You know, got noises in the background, air conditioner running, see what kind of noise cancellation there is and whatnot. So let me know if you think that this would make a good vlogging camera. I think it actually would. On my end, the screen looks okay. The exposure is kind of getting to me though, so it's not that great. But for vlogging, you want it to be stable. And you want to at least see the subject in good audio. So I think it's got at least that stuff. This does have a dual camera setup. Now, while that's cool to have, I don't think it's living up to the hype that it was projected to be like. When you have dual camera with the iPhone 7 Plus or even the Honor 8 and other devices that have dual camera, I don't think it matches the quality, especially to the iPhone 7 Plus. It's better than the Honor 8, of course, because that's a really low budget device, but it's not as hyped up or it's not as better as what the hype was making it out to be. It's pretty cool. The depth effect does work most of the time, but I did find myself liking the iPhone 7 Plus results better than the OnePlus 5. As far as the front facing camera goes, it's decent. It's not the best. You can only get 1080p results from that. You can do fast pace or slow pace videos on either front or the rear, so that's really cool. Which reminds me, the app is really good. It's got a lot of good options in it. It's got most settings that I want, and it's like 95% there. The one thing that's missing that I really like to have is manual settings while recording video. You can do manual settings for photos to where you can get some exceptional shots. But I would really like to be able to use manual settings for recording video, because I'm mostly a video guy versus photo. So since we've talked a little bit about software with the camera app, let's move into the rest of the device with software. This is what I think stock Android should be like. I love the experience from Oxygen OS. If you're familiar with custom ROMs, that's pretty much where it came from. You used to have to root devices to be able to get the software like you're getting with the OnePlus 5. It's a stock Android experience, but you're getting tons more customization. You can really tweak a lot of different stuff in the software from the status bar to the way the screen looks, all kinds of little tweaks and customizations that really make the device yours and make it work the way that you want it to work. Not to mention this thing just flies through things. It's very snappy. I don't know if that eight gigs of RAM is what plays into this. I think even if it had the six gigs of RAM, it would do just as well. We can't talk about the performance without talking about the benchmarks issue. I'm not gonna make it an issue. I know a lot of people care about it and I don't particularly like how OnePlus has handled it, but I don't pay attention to benchmarks. So that's where I'm kind of in the middle. I don't like how OnePlus was trying to bump up the specs or whatever when someone's running the benchmarks. But like I said, I don't necessarily look for benchmarks these days. I don't think it's necessary. So let me know what you think about that situation down in the comments. Is benchmarks a, still a big deal to you or do you not care about it? Have you ever cared about it? And while we're on the subject of what's wrong with the OnePlus 5, the other major issue that I have with my device is that I have that jelly effect. Now, if you don't know what I'm talking about, basically when you're scrolling through apps or just different situations on the screen, you kind of see it flow differently. It kind of has this bounce effect, but Jelly really does sum up the description of what the experience is like. And unfortunately, my device is like that. And it was weird. I remember seeing some kind of like, mm, I was looking down at my phone and scrolling through and I kind of saw how the squiggly effect happens. I didn't really think too much of it but then I started seeing more reports about it and I'm like, oh my gosh, this is an issue that they're trying to cover up again, saying that the displays are upside down and it's a natural thing. 
Well, if it's a natural thing, then why aren't all devices affected like that? So this is a defect. No other way to explain it. It's a defect and they need to be able to rectify that situation. It sucks, like it kind of does take away from the quality of the OnePlus 5, but I don't know. I'll let you know my decision of what I'm gonna do with my OnePlus at the end of this review. And one more thing that was kind of like threw me off a little bit or made me tilt my head. I was like, all right, this is sounding pretty cool. It's gonna have some Verizon compatibility. I have Verizon as my main line. And it was kind of exciting when I heard him say on stage that it was gonna have like global first time ever be able to work around the globe without any kind of issues. Well, he was kind of right. It's not 100%. You do get 3G service with Verizon if you do want to try it. It's not worth having the phone with just 3G service. That's like, it'll load some websites. It will, you know, text emails, all that kind of stuff will be fine, but you want that 4G LTE experience. So I was kind of let down about that. It wasn't a surprise to me. It was worth trying putting that SIM card in there. I do use Simple Mobile on the side for devices that are just GSM. Actually, Simple Mobile is a pretty low cost option. I'm paying only 25 bucks for one gig and you can re-up and all this kind of stuff. It's got some really low cost. I'll leave a link down below in the description if you're interested in signing up for that service. I think it's a good one if you just need some small amount of data. 25 bucks for one gig ain't bad. It's like good enough for me to be able to test out devices, but they do have higher gig plans to get, you know, truly unlimited kind of stuff. And, you know, just check it out. I'll leave that link down below. But it would have been nice to be able to use this as my daily driver device on Verizon. It would just be fantastic to use it. It's my favorite device every year, but I can't use it with Verizon yet. Maybe when 5G comes out, something will change in the game. Until then, just go with GSM. If you got Verizon, don't bother getting this phone unless you just want it for an extra device or something like that. So how does this compare with other flagship devices? I've been using the Galaxy S8, the HTC U11 as main devices the last couple months. And I say it still stacks up against those guys. And the reason why I say that the OnePlus 5 wins in some departments would be the customization. You got tons of it. It's just really cool what you can do with the OnePlus 5. It's got a great hardware design. It's got a pretty good camera. So it checks off all those boxes. But where it kind of misses out is that you don't have wireless charging. You don't have waterproofing. You know, some stuff like that. But another win that this device gets is that it's a lot less cost of what especially the Galaxy S8 or the S8 Plus cost. The HTC U11 is a bit more money, but you get more with that for the most part. So it really kind of comes down to what you can use the device with. One, the HTC U11 is unlocked and it can be used off Verizon, T-Mobile, AT&T, and all those kind of places. So it really, like if you're looking for more unlocked compatibility, you know, go with a Verizon S8 because it's unlocked to all networks, but the HTC U11 comes unlocked. You can get it with four different colors and all that kind of stuff. You got SD card support. You know, there's a bunch of perks that these other devices lay out, like wireless charging, SD card support, water resistance. So if those kind of features mean a lot to you, the OnePlus 5 is not gonna be the device for you. But the OnePlus 5 might be for you if you want a really solid software experience, a good camera, nice hardware, it's just a great overall experience. It's got some flaws, I can't deny that. And I think pretty much every OnePlus device that we've seen has had some sort of flaw here and there, but what device doesn't? Pretty much every single device that you get these days have some kind of flaw in some kind of area to where they could have done better. Would I recommend this phone? Yes, if you don't get the jelly effect. If you get the jelly effect, send that joker back and tell them you're not gonna be happy until you get one that doesn't have that. They should not be sending out phones that have that jelly effect. That's just wrong. It's a defect. You don't ship customers defective devices. So what am I gonna do with my phone? I'm gonna send it back. I'm gonna save my money and get the essential phone that comes out. I think that's gonna be a good one to get and check out. It's gonna cost a bit more. So that one's $700. And again, this one, I mean, it was 540 bucks. It's not a bad deal. It's more expensive than what they've done before, but it's still a good deal compared to what you get. It's just when it has that defect like the jelly thing, it just kind of turns me off. I can't use it with Verizon as my main phone anyway, so it'd be fun to have it as an extra toy or whatever, but that's just me, that's my situation, so I'm returning this thing. It's been good, it's been real, but 
almost happens every time. I get the one plus and I end up selling it or I've never returned one, but I have sold the other ones that I've gotten. So that's been my experience with the OnePlus 5. It's a good device. It's pretty much a great device in most respects. It's just that Jelly Effect was the nail in the coffin for me. If I didn't have that issue and if I just actually needed the money better, I would probably keep the device. It'd be fun to have on my simple mobile plan or something, but it's not gonna happen. If you have the 5, let me know what your experience has been like down in the comments. If you don't, what kind of questions do you have? I'll try to answer those down in the comments below. Thank you guys so much for watching. I do appreciate it. If you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Also hit that notification bell so you don't miss any more videos from me. Share this video with your favorite social networks and until then, stay techie.